So um, again, I'm Franklin Dement. I'm a lead product manager at a company called Haya. Uh, we work on essentially building out solutions to the fact that your phone doesn't work anymore. So on the one side, uh, spam prevention and detection, working with partners like AT&T. On the other side, uh, phone number search and business search, partners like Samsung. I work on the search side. Um, we're going to be talking a lot about uh, data products tonight. I specifically have built out search and recommendation products before um, here at Haya and then also at another company called JW Player, uh, which was in New York. Uh, it's a video platform, an online video platform that I worked at. Um, and then before that, previously, I worked on data and analytics projects for companies that were focused on child welfare, on e-learning, things like that. Um, so kind of a lot of experience in the space um, since like 2010 or so, and then I've worked in software for the decade before that. So tonight, just wanted to talk a bit about you know, these data product biases and assumptions that we have. So everywhere you go, you're going to hear about um, things like AI, ML, big data. Everyone wants to build data products. Everyone wants to unlock the potential of having that monetization loop uh, where you're constantly generating more data. And so I'm going to dive into that a bit, and I'm going to talk a little bit first about just some general things around biases and assumptions in product management. So first off, just some definitions. Um, Data products, what are we talking about? And this is an important thing. Um, I wanted to cover this right away. I kind of reordered this slide a few times. Um, but I think it's pretty important because this word or phrase gets thrown around a lot. Um, and it can mean just about anything. Um, and really, this is what a lot of people have come to th think it means um, for a while. So any application that combines data and algorithms. And that's anything, basically, if you think about it. That's any software application. So software in general is using algorithms, there's always a data store. So it's not a very good definition, it's super broad. So something that's a little better uh, is this one from Mike Lukitis. So a data application acquires its value from the data itself and creates more data as a result. It's not just an application with data, it's a data product. So this gets a little bit deeper into why data products are powerful. Um, it's not just that they're using data, it's that they're actually generating data as well. Right? So they're actually creating value from that as well. And that's, that's important. I think that's missing from the first. And then I like this one even better, and we're going to get a little deeper here, but data products are self-adapting, broadly applicable economic engines that derive their value from data and generate more data by influencing human behavior or by making inferences or predictions upon new data. So we've all used these products today probably multiple times. Uh, everywhere you're looking, whether that be Spotify, Gmail, Amazon, um, a lot of these products are, are kind of filling this, this role. Um, and I think the key thing here that really gets a little deeper is that they're, they're talking about the economic engine that derives value from data. And that's the key piece. So really, if you're just generating more data but you're not able to actually use it and monetize it, if it's not a value, then it doesn't matter. It just becomes a liability for you. And so the key piece here is that you're actually able to generate more economic value from that data. Um, and then I think the last part, too, about influencing behavior and making inferences and predictions, that's where we really see a lot of the value coming in the future. And, you know, um, everyone in here is just waiting to take that first ride uh, in a self-driving car by Waymo or Uber, although we probably all know it's not going to happen anytime soon in Seattle based on the weather here, but they are testing things like that in Arizona. Um, you know, there's, a, there's the autonomous warehouses. There's a lot of examples where um, they're able to, companies are able to deploy applications that are actually either influencing behavior or they're really looking at the environment, reading it, and reacting to that. And so I covered a lot here, but this is, this is what I want us to think about with data products in general. I just don't want us to think about that first definition and just think about any application out there, but I want us to think a little more deeply about you know, why are these going to create more value? And I think that's the important part. So um, this is applicable to me because, as I mentioned, I basically, at my last position, when I was there for about four or five years, Started out, we had you know, some real basic data products uh, in terms of analytics reports and things like that that would barely meet the definition. And we wanted to build out search and recommendations, and I worked on that, building it from Greenfield to having it be a fairly significant uh, source of revenue. And so along the way, I learned quite a bit about um, just some of the things that were uh, you know, hard around that, some of the things that were successful. And one of the big things I noticed was that people made a lot of assumptions about the product from the start. Um, so this is pretty applicable to uh, a larger company where you're trying to start a new product uh, that's a data product or to a smaller company where you're trying to buy, get, generate buy-in. But it's really about those assumptions people have already when you come to them and talk to them about this or when you try and build this or when you're trying to make that next step. Um, and so 
you know, I've talked about assumptions and biases. Let's just review that really quickly. So everyone knows what an assumption is, but I want to be really clear that we're thinking about, you know, when you're assuming something is true or just uh, a proposition or a fact that people take for granted. So obvious, but let's cover it really quickly. And then as I gave this presentation before, someone noted that I was really also speaking about biases. So a lot of the times our assumptions are generated from biases we have, and we all have, you know, these sort of fundamental biases we see the world through. Um, and I think that's applicable in all facets of our life as we know, but especially when we think about like how we can be successful in our careers, how we can build new things, we sort of come to the table with ideas around what's possible. So um, just diving into that a little bit more, I mean, this is sort of pop, pop psychology, but I'll go there anyways, which is that really, you know, there's this general consensus that they lack from a rise, uh, pardon me, assumptions arise from a lack of knowledge or a fear of asking questions. So you're gonna put out an assumption because you don't want to ask because you don't want to seem like you don't know what you're talking about. Um, and product managers, by their very nature, need to always be asking questions and always being the one who's bringing up the why in the room. Um, biases are, I think of them as being like lazy mental models that you slowly adopt um, when we're thinking about them in business perspectives, right? So you see things a few times and then suddenly you start to think, oh, that's how it always is. Um, and, and that can happen for individuals, for teams, and for companies. Um, and it's really, you know, easy to fall into these because they really help you reduce anxiety. So you can lean back onto these. You don't have to worry about if you're right or wrong. They're very comfortable. And I think that's a lot of times why companies, people, and organizations do that. Um, but they cause a lot of problems. So um, I'm sure everyone's had a situation in here where they were assuming something and they were wrong. Someone else was assuming something. They were wrong. It's a common situation you find yourself in everyday interpersonal relationships and everywhere you go. Um, and I think with teams, the problem is, is it increases the chance of failure because you get these compounding effects where you have one person working in one direction and another working in another direction. Um, but in reality, that's sort of an uneasy truth. So we're relying on these things in our everyday life, um, uh, you know, via formal education and around society and things like that. But we really think that success comes from more of an entrepreneurial culture, being independent and questioning. Um, so just getting into that, oops, general product thoughts. Um, I wanted to kind of address this from a general product perspective for people who are newer to product management or thinking about taking classes, things like that. Um, and one of the main things that I look at product management as being is really the questioning of assumptions. So when you start out as a product manager, this is the first thing you're going to see. You know, I need this feature, then the product will work the way I want. And always very tempting. I think everyone has probably done this if they've been a product manager or a project manager or a decision maker. They've said, okay, yes, let's go ahead and build that, right? Because that's what you, th you know, somebody knows what they need. They want that, and so you assume that they're right. And then same thing happens sometimes from sales, biz dev, leadership, other stakeholders. Deliver this feature set and we'll be successful. So you have these assumptions that are already built in, um, and really what our jobs are to question those. Um, then I'm sure there's a lot of other examples you guys have. I don't know if anyone wants to call any out, but. So I, I think about, you know, a lot of times in my work, and I think you should too, is really how can you be the one to sort of prod people back towards questioning the assumptions they already have? Um, and a lot of that's about being a curious skeptic. So, you know, you, we really value experiential data, experiential data, pardon me. Whether that be product usage data, customer support tickets, sales calls, or shadowing users, you need to know what's really happening. Uh, and that helps you understand not only the problem space, but also how it specifically is affected by the market conditions, your company, your users, uh, and how you can take those raw data points and bring them to a solution. Um, and I think the other thing is, is that you're, you're always questioning, and I kind of mentioned this, but you, you need to ask why a lot. Um, and you want to be reanalyzing customer data and user experience research, not just relying on what people have done in the past. You want to be constantly rethinking this and reevaluating. And one of the things I think it's hardest to do is to go back and look at your own assumptions too. So there's going to be times when you make decisions and have hypotheses, and then you know, going back and questioning those is something you also have to do. And I think that's a, a piece that a lot of people forget or don't want to do, myself included, because you go back and a lot of times you think, well, I was wrong there, I could have done this differently. Um, but I think that really helps you get to that next level where you're able to sort of d go through that process more quickly and iteratively. Um, and then the last thing here is, you know, that's what a lot of the product and design frameworks are about. That really getting through these hypotheses quickly, relying on raw data, iterating, and not being afraid to be wrong. Um, and I think that sometimes gets lost in the process 
and in the pragmatic aspects of it. So this is kind of an overview for you guys, um, but I wanted to quickly talk about user personas too. So personas are fictional characters designers use to reflect user types. Um, I think you all probably know this, but basically um, one of the things I think people do is they do a lot of assumptions around user personas. So they think they know who their products are for without really digging into it. Um, and to get into one of the first assumptions I found, which was uh, I was told kind of early on that I wasn't going to be able to build a data product that would make both the customer and the end user happy, just because of the nature of the product. It was a recommendations engine, um, and therefore um, we were selling this recommendations engine to customers who were publishers, but the end users were really the people we were trying to reach. So it's this kind of duality where you have um, your paying customer um, is not really concerned about the same thing as your end viewer is, right? The end viewer wants to watch better videos, the paying customer wants to make money. So how do you kind of align those two things? Um, and that was a problem that I was faced with early on. Um, and I'll dig into that in a second, but I want to talk a bit more about this because I think that, you know, we kind of uh, are used to thinking about personas in sort of very basic terms, but um, really pretty much everyone now is dealing with this. And I think the one place where people don't often see it is that a lot of times now there's this persona of data privacy, which is that you have regulators who you need to be thinking about with your product as well. And so I wanted to touch on that because I think this is a little bit more of a complex topic, but it's something I've noticed in the past few years cropping up as I think about data products and start to build them out. And that's that you have this whole other set of sort of shadow stakeholders uh, or shadow personas where you need to be worried about what they're um, thinking about the regulations they're creating and really understanding that as you're building out your whole product. And so an example of that would be with GDPR um, for recommendations, you need to tell people why something is being recommended. So suddenly there's this whole other requirement that doesn't have anything to do with your viewer or with your customer, but that you have to fulfill. And so I think that um, you know, it, it's an important thing to think about um, a little more closely. And it sort of takes that first statement and it means you can't really think like that. Like you're always gonna be having these multiple personas you have to build for. You're always gonna have um, different requirements that are kind of take you away from thinking about just fulfilling that user's needs or just fulfilling that customer's needs. Um, and so one of the things that's kind of a basic uh, toolkit for product managers to think about the user and buyer personas. So you guys have all been to product uh, events before and you, you seem like you kind of have a little bit of experience. Um, so I will go through this pretty quickly, but um, I've realized um, that they're utterly critical for a data product MVP success. And so um, the key there is really that um, if you don't have a, a product that shows the buyer persona exactly why they're getting value from it, then you're going to be missing out on actually succeeding. And so a lot of times I think what happens is that some of the stakeholders for a given project are really focused on the end user and you have to circle back around and help them understand why that's so important to go after the buyer persona. Um, and one of the ways you can do that is really focus on the top line KPI for the customer. So what are they trying to improve? Um, with the recommendations product, it was actually all of these. So what they really wanted to do was create more ad value. They wanted to grow their user base and they also wanted to increase engagement. Um, and so uh, what I did was I was able to focus in on one of these top line KPIs and really look to make that my goal for the first iteration of the product. And so I think one of the things that um, people do is they kind of look at a broad swath of things across both the buyer and user persona, and they try and accomplish everything. And when you're building out a product from scratch, that can be a good way to make sure that you don't really accomplish anything. Um, and so one of the things that, um, specifically with data products, because they can be uh, more time consuming and they can also require more resources, I think focusing in and really understanding what it is you're trying to accomplish for that person who's gonna be making the decision to buy or to say that the product is actually bringing value to the marketplace is critical. So. One of the things that you can do um, is really once you drive value towards that KPI, then you're able to prove out the product value and you can work to support more advanced use cases. So after the customer is mostly happy with an MVP, that's your chance to reevaluate the problem space and user needs and perhaps update your original analysis. And then um, one of the things I found was that it was possible to really reuse uh, a lot of features um, when it came to um, data generation and things like that. So, um, for instance, if you are looking to create analytics reports, you can drive that off the same engine that's actually uh, 
creating your recommendations. Um, so we, we had a trending recommendation and we used that same exact database um, at the end to create both the recommendations and the reports. Um, so that's an example of kind of like dual purposing the solution. Um, and then, you know, I wanted to make sure to really talk about how sometimes it is best to reinvest in the original value proposition. So there will be cases where you can't take, um, take it to the next level and you need to kind of think about how you can extract that value again from the product. That was sort of like the initial concern that was faced when I was working on this project and, and I've worked on some other projects, but there are some deeper ones that came up as I got further into it. Um, and I think those are some of the roadblocks that come up for people when they're building new data products. Um, so one of the ones that came up quite often was that I was trying to build a new, can you read that? I was trying to build a new data product in a company with an existing product and revenue stream. And so how would we do that? Um, and you know, a lot of the same kind of things came up that were blockers on that, which is it's not in our DNA. Um, and it's not, it's going to be distracting from the core product. Um, you'll never convince existing customers to buy it. And it will never scale. And so I was supposed to actually go in a different order in terms of the, the answers there, but um, I wanted to go through those one by one. So um, it's not in our DNA, and I think that that's a, kind of a common cliche thing that can be said about a lot of different um, projects and products. Um, but what I wanted to talk about a bit was that it's about the narrative that you create around why you're building this product out. So um, you know, it's not about the company itself, it's about whether you can find that key value proposition that will make customers happy. And so I think the way that you can get to um, value quickest is by getting something out in the market and then really um, understanding if that's actually going to fit with your, with your strategy. Um, and that's along the same point, um, you'll distract us from focusing on the core product. The reality is, is that if you're able to build something out and you're able to generate revenue, um, that's a value to the company and it's something that should be thought about. So, and then market fit. And so something that is important, I think, is really understanding how you can get out to market quickly um, and get that fit and understand, get that feedback immediately. Um, and then it will never scale. And I think that scale is a good problem. And you've heard that before, but um, that's something that you don't need to worry about until you have that problem. So these are some older product assumptions, but they come up a lot with data products because they tend to be where the experimental products are, are going and they tend to also be um, you know, where a lot of the VC money is going and, and um, sort of where uh, some of the larger companies that are in our lives have found success in terms of generating new revenue streams. So now, now we're getting into sort of these, these um, really data-focused product assumptions. And this is one that comes up a lot, um, which is that raw data is the truth. And so I get when everyone to just think about that, like probably I've heard an example of that in the past week, I'm sure, where someone's pointing to some kind of raw data in quotes and calling that the truth. Um, so I have some interesting quotes I found from a pretty good article that'll be included in this. Um, I'd come across some of them before, but I think they really talk uh, to the fact that, you know, we make a lot of assumptions around what data can do. And a lot of times um, we're providing our own context without knowing it. And so this first one's interesting. Raw data is both an oxymoron and a bad idea. To the contrary, data should be cooked with care. So this is a little bit complex to unpack, but um, if you think about it, whenever you're collecting data and gathering it, you're at some point tr changing it. So even if someone is taking data from a sensor, that sensor was using something to pull signals from the environment and roll it up into some kind of data point. Even if you're you know, grabbing stuff that from a data store directly, somehow that information got in there. So there was some kind of process done to it before it was recorded. And a lot of times those processes can change and they can add context to the data that we aren't really paying attention to. And so um, that's kind of what this quote is getting into. And that's really that the collectors of the data uh, are the ones who are able to put that first analysis on it before it's ever even looked at by anyone else, and they can really shift the direction in which it moves. Um, can anyone think of an example of that where the collection of data really has a, a, an effect on the data itself? So one of the things that 
came up uh, specifically around recommendations when I was building it out. Um, and this was, I'll just say it was from some people on the data science team, was that the data product had to be more complex than I was planning to make it. So I think this is something that um, I've heard in other, other situations around search um, and also around data and analytics in terms of graphing and charting. And that's that it has to be more complex. It can't be this simple. Like there's gotta be something else to it. You know, they, there was expectations that it would be more complex. And I just wanted to see if anyone had any ideas why, why someone would think that. Like, why would they want the product to be more complex? Because it kind of goes counter to what you might imagine. Um, and then I talked about this a bit to a scale, but this is the same for complexity. Complexity makes it much harder to improve or change or maintain a product. So if you can imagine some, any system and you make it really complex, um, you know, it's, you're not really going to know what's going on all the time. It's going to be much harder to understand the edge cases. It's going to be much harder when you want to make adjustments to make adjustments. And people might actually, um, you know, sort of end up building their own perspective on the product around the complex parts that you aren't excited about. Um, and I think that it's hard to make simple things because it forces you to really focus in on your problem definition. You really have to understand what the user's problems are and, and you really have to know um, exactly um, what solutions to kind of create to start with to provide value. And so it's a bit harder. It's much easier to say yes to everything than it is to say no to stuff. And one of the best things you can do is just say no to a lot of stuff in my opinion, because if people really need it, they'll keep coming back again and again and again. Um, and some of the biggest mistakes I've made have been sort of getting excited with a customer or a stakeholder about something and going a little bit past what was um, really obvious from the data on the ground, either from you know user research or marketplace analysis or customers and just getting excited, adding that extra feature in, and realizing then later that it was something you didn't need. Uh, and then I talked about this a bit, but this is kind of with the scale. I think speed to market, especially now, and this, this has been true for a while, but it keeps getting more and more true, um, especially as some of the larger companies in the world are able to deploy you know, teams that are twice the size of small companies to immediately work on a product. So um, if you can get something out quickly, um, that's gonna be way better than waiting for something better. Um, because by the time you get something better, it may be too late. And this is kind of a, a basic thing, but I feel like a lot of these things I'm saying that are a little bit basic, they bear repeating because they get forgotten a lot. So on that note, I just wanted to talk quickly about the recommendation stuff that I worked on um, with this quick infographic. So uh, what we were trying to do was build, JW Player was a, it is still an vid online video platform that's been around forever. Uh, the founder wrote uh, the first video player that was used on YouTube, and uh, they sold to, and still do, to a lot of online publishers. So Vice, Eurosport, um, a bunch of like mid-tier publishers. So big, but not super big. Um, and they had always had a video player and an online video platform. So basically think about YouTube or Vimeo, but a company can buy it and white label it. Um, so you know, you're getting a little too big for YouTube, um, you don't want to share 45% of your ad revenue, so then you go to JW Player, you buy the product, um, and you can start to put ad tags in and get all the advertising revenue yourself. Um, but you need developers, uh, you know, you need a little more support, so it's like that next step up. And what we were missing was a recommendations and search product. And so when I joined, um, that was one of the things I was tasked to build uh, along with some of the other data pipelines and data products. And so I split the team off uh, into three separate teams and I took over the discovery team, which was really around search and recommendations and started out from the ground up. Uh, and so what we ended up doing, and this is sort of the, the second iteration, the first iteration that I really wanted to do was just have essentially random um, a random algorithm, so random recommendations. We had no recommendations. So the idea is that you're, let's say you're publisher X, and you, have, you need to have a good amount of content. So you've gotten fairly big, you're using ads to monetize, so you're putting pre-roll ads in and monetizing there, um, and you just can't get people watching enough videos. So they usually come in from a social media site like Facebook, watch one video and then leave. And you're, you don't want them going to YouTube, you want them to stay on your owned and operated property and watch videos with ads that you control. So how do you get more videos to them? And recommendations is the very obvious and was at that time lacking way to do that. And it was, you know, there was a big customer demand for it. And it's also an obvious next step um, for a couple of reasons. One was that there's a really large um, number of these players out in the world sending back data. So there's a huge data stream that we could work on. And the other one was that um, you know, it's something that people have come to expect. So by the time we got around to building it, it was really a parody product almost. Like 
people, publishers knew they wanted it, customers wanted it, users wanted it. People were kind of hacking together their own solutions to try and get it. So the idea was that we would initially beta it for free and that then we would charge for it. Um, and then it would pay for itself because by getting these additional views, you're gonna get additional ads as well. So indeed, the idea was simply, you know, starting out from scratch, what I wanted to do originally to keep it simple was just use random. So just pick a random video from the library and show it. Um, and the, we had uh, you know, a team of data scientists and engineers and everyone wasn't super excited by that because they wanted to use something more cool. And so we did do that. Um, uh, and what happened was it didn't scale, actually, right? So we started out, we tried to use a pretty interesting technique, um, but that specific component didn't scale, which is something I kind of knew was gonna happen, um, but you know, we had those resources, and so you know, they really wanted to go that direction, and they did. And so what we ended up doing instead was something a little bit simpler. Um, so once we realized that we had that problem, we went back and we tried something a bit more um, straightforward. So if everyone in here watched uh, one video of cats and then a video of dogs, if right in a row, right, or together, if somebody else comes along and watches a cat video, then we probably want to give them um, the dog video, right? So super simple um, association rule mining, basically. Um, and then the next one was content matching. So another easy thing to do, t look at your titles and descriptions, do basic matches, right? So. If, you're got video, if you have videos, pardon me, on you know, um, wrestling, which we had WWE was one of the customers, then you're gonna get more videos on wrestling or the same wrestler, things like that, very simple. And then the last one was trending. So what's being watched? Just fill that in. Now, this is extremely simple compared to any recommendations algorithm you're using today, like Spotify, YouTube, Netflix, way more advanced. And I'll get into what we did later and that's more advanced too, but this worked. Because now you're going from having nothing no recommendations to having this. And the lift was anywhere from eight, I think, to 10%, if I remember right, on the first video, and then it kind of dropped off after that. But it, it generated you know, millions of additional ads a month, millions of additional views, um, and was a huge success. And so it wasn't very cool, though, right? In that it wasn't cutting edge machine learning technology, it wasn't gonna compete with YouTube and Netflix, but it did the job. So, And so I, I think that that's, you know, that, and that was a hard thing to impress upon people because uh, there was a lot of expectation around it being something that was gonna be more than that. Um, but at the end, the value was seen and we rolled this out and it was, it was um, pretty good. I just wanna give that example of simplicity. Um, and this is probably a review for you guys, but I did wanna mention this because um, it's something that comes up a lot. Everyone is like, oh yeah, of course, A-B testing, definitely need it. Yeah, of course, of course. So good complexity though, I'd say, is always trying to do A-B testing or having an A-B testing or multivariate testing system. Um, this is stuff you guys already know, but um, this is one thing that's often said. It's like, oh, it's the basics, but it's one of the first things people wanna cut. So I just really wanna call that out because I've, I've had multiple projects where everyone knows you need this, but it's the first thing on the chopping block. And I think this is one area to argue for complexity. So this will make everyone's lives a lot more difficult when you have, um, Test running like this, which you know any large company is going to have, you're going to have a lot of difficulties in understanding what's going on. Sometimes you're going to have users getting different views. You might have customers getting different views, and that can make the support uh, team's job harder. That can make sales job harder. But it's something where complexity really brings value because you're able to gather more data, not just for yourself, but for the whole organization. Um, you know, I think it encourages people to think more about data. I think it builds in feedback loops. And I think it also provides a lot of value for sales and some of the other teams that are affected. So I just wanted to mention this um, uh, just real briefly because I think it's one place where it does add additional complexity more than people know. Um, and everyone knows you should do it, but a lot of times people don't. So um, you guys are a little past this. I was, this is more for the beginners, but just an example of difference between A, B and multivariate. With multivariate, there's just simply more options. Okay, and getting kind of going in that direction. So this is another thing that I was told to um, many times is that you have to use big data and machine learning. So just real quickly, you guys may or may not know this, but I'll define the two. So big data, I'm just thinking about large quantities of streaming, real world log or event data. It's gonna require some really different processing or storage techniques um, and where it's more complex to extract meaning not only because of the size, but also because of the velocity and the, the state of the data itself. So this is stuff like um, Kafka and Storm, Kinesis, things like that. There's a 
bunch of tools people use. Um, it seems like a lot of the teams I've worked with have centered in around Kafka or those different derivatives. Um, but um, moving onward, machine learning. Um, I took the d definition directly from Wikipedia because there's a lot of um, you know, different thoughts about what this means. But if you look at their exact definition, it's just going to be um, algorithms and, st and statistical models that are used to perform specific tasks without explicit instructions. So relying on the models and inference instead. Um, it's a subset of artificial intelligence, which we, I don't really want to talk about because it always starts to arguments. But um, machine learning basically is a mathematical model of sample data, and then it generates outputs and predictions based on that without being explicitly programmed to perform that. So essentially looking at past data, running predictive algorithms on it, and then trying to make predictions as uh, real world events happen. So bringing this up because um, a lot of times people think that you can't build a great data product without these two things. So um, talking about the big data piece, um, what I've seen is that it, it can be a great tool or it can generate a lot of noise. Um, so I've seen a lot of teams work really hard to get these systems running um, without really needing them and, and work really hard to generate valuable data out of it and not being able to do that. And so I think that um, I always question, you know, if you actually need to use any of the more advanced big data techniques and if so, why? And are you willing to take that operational cost on? So I don't know if anyone has experience in this room with any of those tool sets or systems, but um, if so, we could chat about that. Um, and I think this goes back again to challenging complexity too. Um, how can we support these tools? Like if we're using more complex tool sets, how are we gonna get to the product faster? And I wanna reiterate that, I know I said it before, but it's something that really is a problem and the more you rely on unknowns and the more you rely on new technology, the harder it's going to be for you to develop your product. And then privacy is something we haven't really mentioned yet, um, but it's an important concern. I talked about GDPR a bit, um, but one of the things you see with both um, big data where you're sucking up a lot of different events and a lot of different data, and with machine learning where you're making inferences and you're looking at broad sets of data is that you're probably going to be needing to be a little bit more um, careful about privacy and you're going to need to be more careful about what you're doing with your user's information. And you also shouldn't always assume there's a problem there, too. So that's the other thing. I think that I want to talk about the other side, because when I get this presentation before, someone mentioned, you know, that's not always a problem. I think that's important, too, is that just because you're doing these things doesn't mean you have a problem. It's just something to be aware of, to be kind of cognitive of. And this is the last one I think is super important. So is whatever you're using stable enough that you would run your life on it? Because your customers will. So it's something to really think about. And a lot of times um, when you work with engineering teams that are really excited about this, they might bring forward some new tool set or some new technology and want to try that. And I think that can be a challenge for a product manager because you don't have a lot of knowledge in that area usually, um, unless you're coming from an engineering background. And even then, they're going to be more up on these things. So I like to look at it in really basic terms about, is this something that you could run your life on? I think that's a good question to ask because you're, you're having people pay you for basically that same thing. They're running their business or their lives on it, and so you want it to be reliable. So, Okay, and then this is just some stuff that I gathered from using these tool sets. I can go through this kind of quickly because... Um, so, talked about this a, a bit, but why do you need the big data? Is it a product need, an engineering need, or a contractual need? I think a lot of times when you dig into this piece, you can understand more if it's something you want to really do or not. So questions like, do we have to collect all this data because it's in our contracts with our customers? Do we need this for the product? Do we just want this for engineering because we think it's going to be helpful? You know, once you start to dig in there, you can see if there's really a need for a specific tool set like that. And then you can see, is it possible to leverage existing work? So this is something to always be thinking of, but is there a way you can use another internal system that's doing this? Can you buy it from a services provider? Can you wait until there's a more mature product or something else that will work? So just things to think about. I'm kind of always pushing back on, uh, you know, do you need the specific technology? And if you have to build new, you want to choose stable, open source, and heavily supported tool sets. So kind of an obvious thing, but people sometimes don't do that. And then, um, again, back to sort of the privacy or GDPR regulations, which uh, we all have to think about more as we move forward because uh, if you have users anywhere else in the world 
Um, besides here, you probably have a European user um, somewhere. And so I'm, I'm a little murky still on if the rules apply in the States, but I know that it, they apply to European users or anywhere else in the world. Okay. So one last slide, I believe, or two last slides. So this is around machine learning. Um, and what we eventually did with what I showed you there was we moved to using machine learning, um, something called word to vec which looks for semantic meaning in words and tries to match it up. So I can talk about that a bit more at the end if people are interested, but we did implement that later. And what we did was we actually waited. So we tried it at first and it failed. And then a year later, um, I had a, a tech lead and we looked at it again and a bunch of new tools had come out, some from Facebook and some from other folks that made it really easy to do. So it's kind of an example of all those different things, which is like, you know, starting simply, waiting until you have success, um, and then going after something that's open source or heavily supported once it's mature enough. And so we got a lot of the benefits we wanted originally from that tool set, but for a lot less cost. So on that note, um, it's difficult to know what techniques will work for any given project or product. And what this really means is that um, the field is super new. Um, people think that they know where something will work and a lot of times they don't. Even data scientists who are super skilled have a lot of trouble understanding what might happen when they take a specific set of training data or data, run it through one of the tool sets and try and build a model that works. Um, you know, training data is super important. Um, Basically everything uh, that we have that works really well with respect to machine learning is because there's a huge pool of data, which is why Amazon, Google, all those guys, Facebook have such an advantage. It's not about the algorithms really, it's more about the data, the training data specifically, um, at least for now. Um, if it's hard to get two people to agree on something, it's probably not gonna be a very good fit for machine learning. So it really relies upon things that are known. Um, so an example that I was reading about um, was it's super easy to um, like essentially to use movie reviews, wine reviews, things like that to kind of get a pretty good idea of how you can have a, a, a machine learning tool rate something. But if you go onto Twitter and you try and pour in tweets and look for sentiment analysis or things like that, then you have a lot of trouble because there's a lot more of a common language in like movie reviews and wine reviews and a lot more of a kind of a common understanding of what to say and what's good and what's bad than there is on Twitter where there's just a you know, huge swath of information and ideas and opinions. And so if you can't really, if it's not a space where you have some sort of commonality and like basically a group of experts, you're gonna have a hard time um, figuring out how to train a machine to make any sense of it. And that's just sort of a general rule. I'm sure in the next year and a half or two years that'll be broken, but that's the case now. Um, and this is a big one. So. This is, I think, important for any software system, so just to kind of take it back a bit. But what happens when it fails? So you, you should always be thinking about the failure state of things. So especially with any kind of um, system where you're you know, looking to do automated, automated predictions or you know, automated recommendations, what happens when you don't have a recommendation? So what we did when we didn't have a recommendation was we just put in the videos by publish date. So we put the newest video in, right? So if that overlay I showed you loaded up and there was no recommendations because something was broken, it would just load the newest videos. So you want to always have a, f a fallback state for everything. And I think that's, that's a place where um, people are afraid to do that because it's kind of saying this is going to break, but it's going to break. Just, just go for it. So circling back around to the very beginning, um, you know, I talked a bit about the fact that there were narratives needed for success. And I think um, it's gotten really, uh, or pardon me, a specific book has gotten really popular lately um, in Silicon Valley and in tech circles, and that's Sapiens, um, which is talking a lot about uh, human cognition, narratives, things like that. It's, uh, you know, there's a new book that he has out too, and I can't pronounce his name, it's Yusev, um, no, uh, the last name just escapes me. But um, anyways, the point is, is that he really gets into what changed about human cognition, and that was our ability to create narratives. And if you think about it, we're all um, sort of wrapped up in narratives every day, whether that be our own personal narrative, our narrative of our company, the country's narrative, and really everything is based around a story that we or other people tell us. And that's what allows us to interact and coordinate. Um, and it's a pretty interesting book. I just uh, kind of uh, gotten into it, but um, you can find PDFs to talk about sort of the general themes. But if you think about that, um, specifically for product managers, one of the things we do is we build that narrative. And that's really what the product vision is. And you have to get people to not only believe that, but to understand it on sort of a more personal level. And one of the things that I've realized with data products is that 
Um, not only do you need that product vision, but you also need to get people really focused on data itself. So you really need to get them loving and understanding like why is data important. I think we, I heard people talking about that a little bit before the class, but why is data important and why is it useful? And so if you don't have that foundation, it's going to be really tough to move on from there. And the other thing we need to do as product managers is make sure that we have an achievable product roadmap. So if you have uh, you know, this narrative of a product roadmap and everyone knows it can't be accomplished and they know it's not true, then you've lost a lot of credibility right there and you're not going to get anywhere with what you're trying to build. And so that's the one thing, especially with new products or with the data products as I've talked about them, you need to really be focused in on that value and on delivering something simple that's going to work. And you know, 10% of any products related to all these things is better than nothing. So getting something out there, getting it working, that's way more important than worrying about building the best thing possible. And a lot of times you'll be pressed as a product manager to create an unachievable product roadmap and I think that's one of the hardest things to do is to really resist that um, pressure. You know? And that's your job. And so it's kind of one of the unpleasant parts of it, but it's something that every product manager needs to get comfortable with and understand why it's very important that they're the ones that do that. So um, I just wanted to stress that point. But, and then buying from key stakeholders. This is kind of a basic one. We talked about this a lot. But I think it's even more important to get the peers on board. So when you're starting out something new, you want to be sure that other product managers that you're working with, other team members, really understand why you're doing that. Um, and then this last one is really, you know, um, this is, these are traits that product managers in general kind of need to have. Um, you need to trust in your team. You need to have patience about, um, you know, your plans and about uh, what your team is working on. And you also need to be okay with failure. So... Um, and then, you know, this is just summing it up, really. It's what I think is the most key thing, is that getting that out there, uh, the data product into the market to validate the value, the revenue, and to get that feedback loop generated. So, and then the last part, don't forget to have fun. So I think a lot of times, um, you know, just to speak openly, product management can be a stressful job. Um, it can be a situation where you're responsible for a lot of things and you're wearing a lot of hats, as they say, which means really that you're trying to fill in the gaps where other people might not be either resourced or uh, they might not be um, you know, working on something that you need. And so I think it can feel sometimes um, like a lot, um, but one thing that's important is just to remember that you know, your team is really looking to you um, to be the one to kind of have that sense of humor, to have that resilience that will lead to being successful. Um, and it's something not to forget. And I think um, you know, that's one of the things I know that um, when product managers get together, they talk about a lot. Like, how do you, how do you create that light sense of um, kind of excitement around things? How do you keep the team happy? And those intangibles are really important.